this session it's uh, on uh, data triangulation i am not of course uh, here to teach you what is data triangulation i'm assuming that everyone knows and everyone is interested on like on how to use the system uh, to actually improve their analysis um so in general, just as data triangulation here, um, we are just assuming that like we need to use multiple sources to have a more comprehensive and holistic perspective to uh, generate information for our actions. In, in general, of course, we know that there are quite a lot of added value. It is a complex process that requires a lot of work and requires the, the understatement that uh, in theory, you should have uh, all your information at hand, uh, hopefully all in one uh, national repository that allows you to actually triangulate this information. Of course, by tri triangulating, you are um, trying to also reduce biases and errors so your data become more accurate. You're trying to also um, have multiple sources to avoid any kind of distortions that could actually um, raise by just using just one single source of data. You are actually might mm, might have as a result uh, like uh, increase your effectiveness because having your uh, a, a deeper understanding and a deeper um, a, amount like also having a, a larger amount of data, you might want to have a, like a more nuanced uh, analysis of your information. Um, another added value, of course, is the engagement of the different stakeholders, because uh, in a lot of cases, in a lot of countries, different stakeholders are also collecting part of your of the data that will then feed into your national in your national system, and also increases transparency of uh, of your of your actions. Um, but most importantly, the added value probably uh, of triangulation is definitely building on all these reliability, uh, validity, all your extra insights to support your decision making process and to actually do programmatic decisions for all the different programs that you are supporting. Of course, in health programs, there could be different kind of triangulations that you want that you might want to do, like you can do like, a, I don't know, program outcomes across different periods. So you might want to triangulate, okay, what happened this year and last year together with other type of information. You might want to do, for example, other um, different age groups and subgroups. Uh, and then you might want to do, I don't know, like it's written here, different program outcomes di di among uh, um, age groups, or also very important, comparing data from different type of surveys and maybe triangulating this data also on top of your routine information that you're getting, like let's say, for example, coverage, let's say, uh, like, I don't know, any kind of results of, of activities that you might want to do, for example, either in facilities or communities. And of course, like you can also ch start checking your triangulation about your outcome, for example, from your different health programs in different geographic areas. Therefore, you might start to check also a little bit of a pattern if there is any kind of uh, geographical patterns uh, for, for outcomes. The, I mean, the, the type of translations that you can do are immense and almost infinite, let's say. And of course, we know quite well the information that you can triangulate about surveillance, about your stock, and about your EPI, so any kind of like immunization data. But there is also other, other examples that, and some of them today will be covered also from our presenters. So like, for example, entomological and vector control data together with your, with your um, surveillance data. You might want to triangulate your routine uh, and administrative data together with your uh, survey data. Very important also for um, validating your population data. In some cases, you might want to triangulate your information that is coming from estimates together with the information that you might want to collect from the community and also from the, the censuses that you're having probably some countries doing more often, so countries doing less, less often, that's even more important in this case. And of course, it can also be uh, also very important, actually, um, triangulations between the information that you're getting from your HMIS and the information that you're getting from your CHIS. Therefore, maybe uh, triangulating the kind of information that you're getting from communities and the, and, the, and the information that you're getting from your health facilities. That's also very important when, it, when we're talking about surveillance and, of course, uh, EPI. So, as you can see, these are just like a, a couple of examples out there, but the examples are infinite and it's very dependent on the availability of data that you have in, uh, in your national repository. 
again, for example, here, I mean, these are things that we get on, on a daily basis also from, uh, from uh, our use cases out there. Here we are looking at BCG coverage. Like here in the in the little dot, we are having like the information that you collect from uh, from community uh, data, and here in the in the actual in the actual area, we are having the the information that that have been extrapolated from the facilities. You can see that in some cases it matches, in some cases it doesn't. But how will you ever figure it out if you never actually bother to triangulate the different sources that you are presented with? Same story with the uh, EPI and IDSR. Here you have, for example, your measles cases that are confirmed, and here you have your MR coverage. In some cases, the cases are very high, could be due to the fact that uh, the coverage is very low, but it can also be due to the fact that, for example, some, um, some coverages, although very high, might be targeting like too late the, the children, and therefore the children will be exposed to the, to the disease that for which they should, in theory, be protected instead. So there are quite a lot of things that can be done and a lot of interpretations that are normally ignored unless you actually start digging a little bit further. Uh, I don't want to take more time because today we have uh, four presentations that are very interesting and show us different use cases. We have the two first presentations um, that talk about data triangulations also with immunization data. One is more to try to find uh, uh, zero doses children and it's, an, an, it's a use case coming from Rwanda. Then we have Vincent, who is going to, tr to talk to us about uh, um, trying to find in Kenya um, missed opportunities, which is an incredibly important activity to be done. And then we have two, two other use cases that are more about uh, um, surveillance of, uh, of, uh, uh, and vector control. So one, it's, uh, it's about like also the way that they have done um, a, a micro stratification process to support their outreach uh, activities. And another one on uh, the, the strengthening of uh, vector surveillance based also on their vector control in, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan. So actually without further ado, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if Samuel, unfortunately, mm, is not Dr. Adeline who is going to present. It was supposed to be Ines, but unfortunately she's also unavailable to present. So we have Samuel, Ruanganira, I hope I haven't butchered your surname, uh, who is the coordinator for the DHS2 data triangulation and for Afinet. And uh, yeah, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if they are online and they are co-host, uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, no, actually stop sharing. I'm getting there. Huh? And then I have to put the different speakers. Is it this one, the right speakers? Um... Yes, and uh, and Samuel, if you're online, can you please uh, try to share your screen? Hi, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. And... Good. We can hear you very well. Can you try to share your screen? Absolutely. Let me share. Yes. Uh, do I have to share the presentation or you will upload um, it? You can, uh, you can share your presentation from your end if you want, All right. if, if you prefer. No Thank you, no problem. I'm trying to find the sharing button here. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen and it's a, a little square with a with a upward arrow and it says oh, share screen. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
You managing? Oh, there you are. We see your folder access denied. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's more for you. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Can you see my screen? I, I still see you need permission to perform this action. You might have shared the wrong window. Oh. I mean, Maybe. I'm saying it for you. Ooh, ooh, I might have seen behind these something interesting. Just trying to share. Yeah, if, if it's difficult for you, we can share the presentation for, for you, and that's not a problem. Oh, sorry about that. No, no worries. Just stop sharing and try sharing again the right the right window that has your present the PowerPoint. Okay. Right. Usually there, there should go. be multiple windows that you can try to present. There you go. Think, Perfect. All right. Okay. Perfect. Um, we see it. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to share our work on um, uh, the DHIS2 data triangulation for immunization and vaccine preventable diseases. Um, we sh will share with you our implementation roadmap and some of the findings. So my name is uh, Bunga Andrea Samuel. I work with Affinet as the project coordinator for the DHIS2 Rwanda. So this is our outline. Um, so to start, the I want to say that the high quality public health data is key to timely and inform the decision making. And in Rwanda, we have electronic uh, health information systems and uh, robot data sets, um, especially within the immunization and surveillance programs uh, under the DHIS2 system. So there are challenges that are associated with the use of these uh, systems for programmatic decision making. And uh, therefore, uh, new methods are needed to integrate these systems and um, find ways to critically analyze and summarize this data. And that's why we designed the DHIS2 uh, data triangulation uh, dashboard with the aim to synthesize and uh, automate vaccine preventable diseases and uh, routine immunization indicators and, and to identify uh, data quality issues and program performance gaps that can guide programmatic uh, decisions. And to illustrate a bit further, I would say that um, the systems that are <coughs> being used in Rwanda, <coughs> excuse me, are the integrated diseases surveillance and response, the expanded immunization registry, uh, which comprises aggregate and uh, individual data. There's the CIVO registration and vital statistics. Uh, there, there is also the vaccine logistics information management system. And um, you can imagine that um, with all the 30 districts and around 56 hospitals, 500 uh, health centers uh, that are using these systems to report indicators at various frequencies, uh, whether daily, weekly, monthly, or quarterly, um, creates a huge amount of data that is not easy for uh, an individual to really summarize and, um, and provide um, good insights. Um, so, um, to address these challenges, therefore, uh, the concept of uh, data triangulation um, was seen as a solution. And of course, um, th this approach will provide more time and opportunities for uh, discussions and actions um, and uh, that can be taken to allow deeper exploration for more complex questions. So. We use the um, global uh, data triangulation uh, guidance 
uh, to explore ways we can compare multiple sources uh, to identify immunization and program performance gaps. And for instance, I can say that um, the vaccination coverage um, may appear very high, at, and yet the high number of cases can still occur um, in a particular geographical area, uh, which may raise questions as to whether the reported coverage is accurate. So therefore, the uh, data triangulation is seen here as a way to identify these gaps in vaccination uh, co coverage. Uh, so we, to start, we identified, um, we developed a roadmap of activities and a timeline for this, uh, for the dashboard development and implementation. So the first activity we developed is um, the data mapping, uh, which essentially um, was aimed to identify um, or map um, data elements, map also systems, first of all, and also metadata among these systems. So um, the next activity that we, we identified is the integration module, uh, is to develop an integration module that will essentially help uh, these multiple systems to share and communicate with each other to share data so that um, a dashboard can be um, uh, developed. So the other activity that we, mm, we conducted, I would say, is the customization and visualization of indicators. So we customized indicators in the systems and integrated uh, programmatically informative dashboard visualization for national and subnational levels. So this is a picture of the, um, uh, or an architecture of the integration module. You can see in the middle, uh, the whole essence of the idea is to make sure that the integr integration module helps these um, multiple systems to communicate with each other. So as uh, dashboard can be, uh, that data can be uh, accessed and the dashboard can be also created. Um, let me uh, invite you to the results section where we, this is, this is a list of uh, indicators that we developed for AFP, uh, measles, neonatal tetanus, and uh, HPV. Uh, so th these indicators for immunity gaps can be uh, grouped in, um, I would say, three categories, uh, but there are multiple indicators. Uh, that were developed, but um, a whole, it's a huge list, but we need to also kind of prioritize some which are useful for program monitoring and decision making. So the priority ones, there are indicators that help us assess the vaccination status or coverage among VPD cases. And we try to do this by uh, age group or uh, timeline or by map. So the other uh, types of indicators that we do is to, is our dropout rates for MR1 to MR2, poly1 to poly3 and DPT to DPT3. And others are zero dose and uh, under immunized rates. So for program performance, we try to um, we have indicators that help us assess the access and utilization of immunization services. Um, here we try to compare uh, the coverage and dropout rates. We also have indicators that help us identify the quality or discrepancy issues in supplements and immunization. Where we, for instance, we try to compare like measles cases in both uh, aggregate and case-based surveillance systems. So the other kind of indicators we have is the surveillance uh, a performance uh, system. Uh, for instance, the sensitivity of um, measles detection, uh, the representativeness of measles by geographical area, the timeliness of lab results, and uh, also indicators that are associated to the lab 
Um, for instance, the lab, the stool sample adequacy. And um, we also have some other indicators like the de detection of measles um, to identify the source of transmission, whether it's um, endemic, imported or both. And try to also to um, distribute outbreaks of measles by um, geographical area and also assess the completeness of investigation of suspected cases. So for purposes of time, I won't go through all the visualizations that we developed, but I will try to um, illustrate a few. And uh, for instance, here we see the, um, on the left hand side, an indicator for uh, measles uh, confirmed the cases by age group and in multiple uh, timelines by year. And this indicator, we try to replicate that in our system. Uh, however, we still also have um, to make some improvement. I would say that the dashboard is now, uh, has now been developed and is under review. Um, feedbacks are being provided to our technical, is being provided by our technical team so that um, our technicians can finalize uh, this dashboard. The other type of indicators you can see on the left-hand side uh, on the global guidance, we have, um, we try to compare uh, zero doses and um, DPT uh, coverage. So by year and by region, on the right-hand side, it's our, in our case, what we try to replicate. Uh, but of course, it has also some um, things to improve on the visualizations. Uh, on the program performance, uh, well, you can see on the left-hand side, the global guidance, um, for instance, they show that you can compare measles cases, suspected cases in IDSR versus uh, CPS system. And we also try to replicate that in our system. Um, the same applies to the dropout rates on the left-hand side, the global guidance, what the global gui guidance um, provides. And we try to replicate that in our system. One thing I can add is that um, we've been using testing data, but soon we will uh, migrate to use actual data. And um, we hope to have um, some uh, really good insights in um, developed indicators. Um, so we have some, of course, challenges, um, but which I would say not, uh, which are minor. The first one is related to data accuracy of using the, the civil registration. We want to use the civil registration and virus statistics um, as denominators for births, um, but the accuracy of data hasn't reached a good level. So we are still using the census data, which provides uh, projections, um, but we hope that in the future, we will be able to use the CRBS um, data. The same applies to the VLMIS, uh, whereby the system has been developed and is being used, but we need to monitor the use and data quality so that um, the indicators that were created can really be uh, deployed and be um, made available to the program users. But right now, we can't say that we are going to use the VLMIS since it has to improve its accuracy. So in conclusion, we would say that being able to finalize the dashboard, uh, we have been able to develop the dashboard and being able to um, um, integrate these systems, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good milestone. Um, we hope that um, once um, we have finalized um, well the dashboard, it's going to improve, make a lot of improvement in terms of uh, monitoring and um, decision making. So we are planning to have a, uh, a rollout training for the national level and the district uh, level actually next month 
And um, we, I would say that one more thing that we have been able to achieve is being able to pull together um, stakeholders to really discuss this kind of issues is also a huge milestone. Uh, for instance, um, the surveillance and um, immunization program, the uh, HISP, and our all stakeholders, CDC, WHO, it's a really huge milestone and it's being appreciated. So also the fact that we will be able to identify these issues in areas, it will help us to provide supportive supervision. And, um, and obviously in the future, we hope that it will have an impact on the incidence of VPD and obviously deaths and as well as in uh, efficiency and management of um, um, vaccine and services which are provided, uh, of course, in the coverage. And um, yeah, it has multiple, multiple benefits. I won't be able to illustrate all of that, uh, those right here. So um, as next steps, we are planning to provide uh, or to conduct the first um, national roller training and also uh, the district for the national level staff and also for the district, district level staff. After that, we will be, we conduct, um, we'll monitor the dashboard use and also document lessons and obviously uh, sustain this kind of collaboration and um, coordination to make sure that um, we stay together and can work together towards uh, the impact. Uh, thank you very much. This is the list. Uh, this is a picture of us in a workshop. And um, these are the few among all the people I can acknowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. And, and uh... I witnessed it myself last time that I was in, in Kigali, like uh, the amount of work that has been put in this, uh, it, it's humongous. And hopefully you'll be able to bring in also like the, the CRVS data soon. It's a, it's a bigger endeavor that you have started. Um, thank you again. Um, you can stop sharing your screen because next uh, we will have, uh, unfortunately we weren't very lucky with these presenters. Uh, everyone had quite a lot of problems with their visa. We only have one person in in, a, in the room, but the next one will will be able to present online as well. We have Vincent Omonde, uh, who is the program officer for vaccine and immunization program at Chai. So, yeah, if uh, if uh, if you want to to actually share your screen uh, and uh, and unmute yourself, that would be great. Thank you very much, Victoria. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. So let me just share my screen. If you can start it off. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here to present to you our finding in Kenya uh, on how we leverage HIS2 to strengthen health systems and improve HIV vaccination in Kenya. Uh, this was through mapping missed opportunities and tracking them and finding the best strategies to identifying and vaccinating on site. My name is Vincent Omondi, as you've heard. I'm from Clinton Health Access, uh, based in Kenya. So I'll just give a little of a background uh, statement and why we are doing this. Um, so in Kenya in 2019, uh, the government rolled, successfully rolled out HP vaccination into the routine immunization schedule that was targeting 10 to 14 year old girls. And uh, since then, a lot of strategies have been employed to accelerate and sustain HPV vaccination. Uh, health facility-based vaccination has been the mainstay approach supported by school-based uh, uh, vaccination approaches. However, school-based vaccination has dominated despite, uh, sub, uh, despite financial strain uh, at the subnational level. 
Our target population for HP vaccination here in Kenya is approximately 3.1 million girls. And uh, as at the end of uh, 2022, uh, our current vaccination rate was at 63%, with a completion rate of 32%. Uh, there have been a significant subnational variation in these uh, performances. Um, during the introduction, the government had targeted to achieve at least 70% vaccination through uh, facility-based vaccination uh, alone, uh, but this only achieved 13% coverage. Uh, part of this high coverage was through uh, uh, school outreaches, and only 13% vaccination was attained during, uh, uh, during, acti during activities that did not include uh, school outreaches. Um, we continue to experience financial strains, uh, especially when it comes to uh, school outreaches, because a lot of resources required to carry health workers to vaccinate the girls. Um, uh, again, uh, part of the challenges that we've experienced with low HPV vaccination in Kenya is the fact that there's a lot of financial constraint in terms of um, doing those outreaches, and uh, also the fact that um, uh, the very low health facility visits among the target population. So there has been a notion that uh, girls aged 10 to 14 year old do not visit health facilities. And so healthcare workers tend to uh, conduct school outreaches to find girls in schools. So we've experienced very low uh, health facility uptake. Uh, in this, in this, in this uh, work, uh, data-driven approach was now employed do some data triangulation uh, and was implemented uh, to, to look at the frequency of health facility visits among this target population to optimize HIV vaccination during these visits. So we looked at, um, uh, did some sort of data analysis and looked at uh, what is the frequency of uh, girls that age 10 to 14, how frequent do they visit health facilities and how can we optimize these visits to optimize HP uh, vaccination at the health facility? So um, our objective and methodology for this triangulation were uh, clear. Uh, so we, our main objective was just to leverage DHIS2 platform to examine the frequency of health facility visits among girls aged 10 to 14 for essential services and evaluate the potential to enhance HP vaccination during these visits. Uh, we employed a few uh, methodologies to, um, to meet this objective. Uh, number one, we utilized outpatient data from the DHIS2 platform. The main data set that data elements that we use were the MOH710, which contained the immunization data, the MOH515, uh, which contains um, the workload data, and also the population from KNVS that enable us to get the target population of 10 to 14-year-old girls. We then combined the triangulation output and selected part of this in a few health facilities. So comparing these visits, uh, comparing these data findings uh, to the total number of HP vaccination administered, we were able to quantify the extent of missed opportunities for HP vaccination uh, here in Kenya. So our data triangulation pipeline followed uh, some um, a few steps. Uh, the first was to gather the elements from DHIS2. Uh, this means we put together the data set, uh, that is uh, MOH 710 uh, for immunization workload, uh, and also MOH 204 for uh, outpatient visit data and DHIS, and DHIS2 data sets. Um, data that is already data triangulated already uh, using um, KNBS data from 2019. Our triangulation approaches uh, was leveraging, uh, looking at approximating total visits during the entire year. Our target year was 2021, and then adjusting these visits per person per visit. Remember, if you look at uh, in the next slide for the results, you will see that um, a lot of um, visits was experienced. Uh, but of course, this visit could be one person can have more than one visit, and so we try to adjust so that we can be able to get approximate per person per visit during that period. And then we conducted now descriptive analysis uh, where we explored the total visits nationally and also looked at them subnationally. And then finally quantifying the missed opportunities and then used these to uh, make some data-driven decision. 
So looking at the results, um, the graph, the first graph represents the total population uh, that we are targeting uh, in Kenya, 3.1 million. So we expect that uh, we should vaccinate at least 90% uh, of this population. Uh, during the year 2021, uh, looking at the out uh, outpatient visits from DHIS2, total of 4,000, 4.7 million girls visited health facility. Those were registered visits. Of course, I've said in initials in initial statement that uh, one person can visit health facility even more than once, or one person can visit um, health facility more than one health facilities, and of course, will be registered as visiting the, the first will be registered as first visit. Um, if you look at 4.7 million visits, and in the country here we have uh, at least 13,000 uh, health facilities, it means that uh, we are having at least 30 visits per month. And if we triangulate this uh, and adjust this per person per visit, we are having at least 1.1 million visits uh, of girls age 10 to 14. So these were, these were approximate adjusted per person per, 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 per visit. So it means that in the, in the entire period of 2021, from January to December, we are able to experience 1.1 visitations of girls aged 10 to 14 years. And this approximated to at least seven visits per month in all the 13,000 health facilities. Uh, if you look at, this, uh, if you look at uh, the uptake during this period, we had uh, HP vaccination for the first dose in that year was 879,000. And uh, this was an uh, uptake that combined both, uh, uh, both outreaches, school visitations, and uh, health facility uh, uh, outreaches. So if we adjust, if we adjust for 13%, which is only health facility visits, we only remain with 114,000 uh, outputs that come from health facility visits only. So if you try to compare the total visits uh, from, from DHIS that uh, uh, that were recorded as visited health facilities in 2021, we had 1.1 million and only 114,000 girls uh, managed to get vaccinated. So that means we had a very big gap of uh, more than uh, 900,000, 1 million girls that had potential to be screened for vaccination, but were not vaccinated. So this is uh, how we were able to quantify uh, the million of girls, millions of girls that attended health facilities without any opportunity to, to, to screen and vaccinate. Uh, so looking at the map, we can see areas that have very high potential of uh, uh, girls visiting health facilities, a lot of high workload and a lot of visitations uh, also vary uh, subnationally. Um, looking at the results, um, that we're able to um, get out of this, the total missed opportunity to screen for eligibility for eligible girls increased six times from 300,000 to 1.6 million when we adjust this for um, uh, health facility visits only. We could see on the previous graph that uh, if we only look at uptake in the health facility, the numbers goes down. Uh, so it means that there's a lot of opportunity to screen and vaccinate at the health facility. Um, so out of 1.2 million eligible girls visiting health facility for essential services, at least 696,000 were potentially eligible for vaccination at health facilities, but only 19% uh, were vaccinated. So it means we had an opportunity to vaccinate uh, a lot of girls who brought themselves to the health facility, but did not get a chance uh, to be screened and be vaccinated at the health facility. So uh, having, done, having looked at all this quantification, we came to a total of uh, 581,000 girls uh, who were potentially missed and were eligible for vaccination and were not vaccinated and they attended health facility in various uh, vaccinated health facilities in the country. And this was five times more than the national uptake during, uh, during that time. Uh, so the screening intervention was piloted in 14 public health facilities and resulted in a 49% increase in HP vaccination. Uh, after doing the data triangulation, uh, we went out there in, in 14 public health facilities and, and implemented this and piloted this in, in, in facilities. And, and after our uh, post-assessment, 
we got an increase in 49% uh, vaccinated in that health facilities. And that is displayed in the graph um, that you can see below. Um, so if you look at the graph on the right, we have 1.1 million girls uh, attending visiting health facilities, potential girls visiting health facilities and are eligible at 696,000 based on the coverage at that point. Uh, and only 114,000 girls were vaccinated at the health facility. So which means we meet the potential to vaccinate 581,000 girls who brought themselves to the health facility for other uh, routine activities. Um, so these findings uh, highlighted the magnitude of missed opportunities for vaccination and emphasized the need for targeted intervention to optimize vaccination during health uh, facility visits. So by addressing all these missed opportunities and maximizing the potential for school-based outreaches, the aim is to significantly enhance the coverage and effectiveness of the vaccination program. So the, the, um, the figure on this screen is a screening, uh, is uh, an example of a screening tool uh, that was introduced uh, after the successfully piloting this intervention. And this brought up um, a vaccinator, vaccination screening tool in form of a, a vaccination stamp. Uh, that uh, the government currently is, uh, is, 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 is preparing training manuals, training materials to uh, train all health, all vaccinating health facilities to have a screening tool for, for vaccination. And this has been scaled even not only for HPV, but, only for, but also for COVID vaccines uh, and routine immunization vaccine to track uh, defaulters and even to track zero dose children in the, in the health facilities. So in this way, all children who attend health facilities through the outpatient visits will be able to be screened, be identified, and if they're eligible for any vaccination, they will be referred to the MCH, to the MCH for, for vaccination. Uh, so this um, uh, has been piloted, has been tested, and currently the government is in the process to uh, train and offer capacity building for the same to be scaled. Uh, a few recommendations here and there. So by leveraging technology like HIS2, uh, the decision-making process in public health can be enhanced, leading to more effective interventions and policies, and also regular explore exploration and utilization of the HIS2 data enables informed and insightful decisions to improve public health outcome. Well, this, these findings uh, provided evidence to support the implementation of the screening strategy, which combined uh, with which, which when combined with other approaches can contribute to achieving the WHO's ambitious target of at least eliminating cervical cancer by 2030, ensuring at least 90% of girls are vaccinated by the age of 15. By implementing these strategies, healthcare system can maximize the potential of health facility visits, leveraging data for target intervention, and improve the overall effectiveness of HIV vaccination in programs in Kenya. Some of the key takeaways include uh, enhanced health facility-based screening for outpatient, for optimal HPV vaccination opportunities, use data-driven targeted approach with digital health solution for vaccination programs like DHIS2 uh, platforms, and also improve monitoring and reporting for of HPV vaccination data, including missed opportunities. Um, and this, uh, um, this this is, uh, brings me to an end of our presentation today, and thank you very much to to uh, people who supported this work. A uh, very great acknowledgement to the Minister of Health, uh, the Clinton Health, and also to the DHIS team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. It's actually super cool. You had really nice, really nice numbers and always gets me very excited to see a, a low P value. Um, the next presenter is actually in person. Uh, that's that's really nice to see in person people. He was one of the lucky ones who got a visa in time. Um, and yeah, he, our next presenter is Rajab Nkoa and, uh, and he's a senior system developer at the University of Dar es Salaam. So, just a second that I share the screen. No, wait, let me open first. Because I'm a disaster here. Uh, it's more complex than you think. Um, you are number three. Please share this, but I also share my screen. 
Is this one? No, it's not that one. No, it's not that one. Yes, it is that one. No, it's not that one. Let me let me try. No, it's not that one. Okay. It's very complex, okay? You do it. <laughs> Where's the presentation? Uh, it's really open. Like, I just need to stop sharing this one. Okay. This one. Did you see it? Okay. To you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, okay. Is it evening or afternoon? Uh, it gets confusing here. So I will say both. Good evening and afternoon. Okay. I have reversed. So my name is Rajab Mkomo. I'm a system developer from University of Dar es Salaam, DHS2 Lab. Um, on behalf of, of my colleague, I'm here presenting uh, one of the work that we have we we, we did. Uh, we call it uh, uh, micro stratification. Um, so just to kick it off. Oh. Oh, Yes, so uh, a little bit of a background uh, is actually, uh, this work is around malaria and uh, due to resurgence of malaria, despite many other efforts, uh, now WHO recommends moving from the direction of all size fits all to a little bit of more tailored or targeted interventions. And most in certain ways, uh, uh, it is focusing on uh, categorizing the, the, the intervention based on the risk aspect. And for example, in Tanzania, they have categorized into level of disease risk from very low, low, moderate to high. Uh, so uh, in a way there are different intervention around that category. And at the moment for, for, for the while, uh, that uh, categorization was only focusing on subnational level, uh, district and region are also called the macro stratification. So they created some stratification uh, or maps to show the malaria risk around region and district. And uh, over years, they have been using ma malaria parasite prevalence data, more specifically school malaria parasite data uh, collected from schools and households. And they have been using, or they have been collecting the data for after every two, two years and uh, all three from the household. So this approach uh, sort of seemed a little bit uh, lacking because it covered a little bit of small area. They actually sampling a uh, hundred houses in every survey that they're doing and use the data to actually uh, categorize the malaria risk maps. And of course, uh, now also, if you see the, uh, the collection interval that is in two years, it little bit not give you that Final, find resolution on the uh, the categorization that you need. So uh, malaria, National Malaria Control uh, Program in Tanzania in recent year uh, sort of came about seeing how best this can be done. And with the availability of data, thanks to DHIS2 platform, uh, that is uh, from HMIS. So uh, NMCP sees like this could be an opportunity to more like uh, use the routine based data that is collected in monthly basis to more like create potential um, risk maps around stratification. But altogether with the increasing empowerment in the decentralization of health sector uh, in the government, so the NMCP also saw the need to more like go towards the granular uh, level for stratification and henceforth now we, we come it in into the micro stratification or wadi stratification. So in our country, the hierarchy level is from the country, region, district, ward, and then villages and facilities. So uh, NMCP sort two now goes into ward stratification. So now how uh, this uh, stratificational risk information can can be realized. So as initially I said, they had used the malaria parasite prevalence. They established a sort of, uh, we can say threshold around what can be very low, low, moderate, and et cetera. But again, now going towards using the data, uh, they uh, sort of established their process towards using the HMIS data now to identify which words are at what categories. 
So uh, based on the DHS2 uh, and UNISM DHS2 lab in collaboration with NMCP and the towards uh, elimination of malaria uh, project uh, worked on uh, more like this stratification uh, or by designing an automated now process that can help creating those different categories. So a little bit of uh, what has been done is sort of to take the data from HMIS, clean them up, at least you can have a clean data, and then uh, more like it create some, some scores or strata around, and then create the risk maps that can be used for micro planning. Uh, so uh, major outputs around the stratification where the risk map for planning, this is the one that goes to uh, uh, the, the, the government to more like be used during the planning, which we call micro planning, but the other output is for monitoring. That's what NMCP use regularly to more like look into how the risks are changing over years. So for planning is, is, is generated after every three years, but for monitoring is generated after every one year. So a little bit of how this process is, is actually uh, first uh, they identify different indicators from which the stratification can be done. So during the identification of the indicator, the sets, the criteria sets for more like processing the data. One way is to remove the duplicate data, missing elements based on reporting and completeness, checking the consistency, assuring that the data that can be used is a, is a little bit clean, etc. And the next, uh, for those the data that seemed a little bit uh, not consistent, uh, they are sent as a feedback for NMCP to more like uh, look them across. Also, in order for uh, stratification, which I said is word is stratification, the other process for mapping health facility to respective word had to be done. And this had to, to use another system, which is health uh, facility registry that has uh, reg is registry for facility uh, and words, which HMIS does not have. Uh, the next process was uh, the stratification process in terms of what is being used. Uh, there are some data that, need, that, that are coming from survey and the population from sensors. So there's also a malaria composite database uh, that is essential, is just basically a database that comprises of survey data for malaria. So all of these data are now uh, grouped together within this database and the process for microstratification that is automated is now uh, running using this data collected from HMIS, from health facility registry and within the composite which include uh, census data like word population, et cetera. So the result is actually with all this together uh, and with the automation, automated process, the malaria risk map is hence generated that can be used for planning. And this now is sent to uh, 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 another system which is called a plan rape, um, a PRLG system that deals with the planning. So the, the map from DHS2 now goes as the input into the planning uh, system. So just a little bit of what I have said, these are criteria for uh, data processing, uh, like checking for, so the, the, the data that was used is lab and ANC data. And of course the cleaning in terms of reporting, we were, we were looking at the missing report in pe reporting periods. Also we are using, we're looking at the empty elements across the data. Also, we are all, 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 only targeting the facility that are performing MRDT tests for the data that we, we, we used. Also, we checked for consistency uh, and also for reporting rate in order to remove the data that may give a little bit of wrong result around the uh, stratification. So the data that had been used or indicators included testing positivity rate, uh, annual parasite index, which also use, uses the population data as a denominator, but also the testing po positivity rate from ANC. Uh, and of course, for, for mapping, as I said, these were the facility that mapped to, to the word and the criteria that had already been created from the malaria prevalence data uh, is in this way. So for each category of indicator, 
uh, there are different criteria on how you can say this is low, very low, et cetera. And again, as we are calculating the score, so this is how uh, from the criteria, you establish a score for different indicator, and then you can have a total score around those indicator. So with this, just to mention uh, uh, all this process from now using the criteria to establishing a final strata had, had been using DHS2 predictors. Thanks to predictors, we, we were able to more like calculate the total score and also uh, in the end calculate the final strata to what now you are seeing in the stratification map. So as you may see, a little bit of achievement on this is now uh, this stratification map is now available in the malaria uh, composite database or they call malaria uh, composite management information system that more likes uh, have contains data that uh, normal HMIS data do not have. And then this report is now sent to plan rep as I highlighted uh, earlier for planning. So a little bit of achievement is that we managed to customize this. And of course, this tool is automatic. And every time, of course, every year, it runs to provide necessary strata for, for, plan, for, for monitoring. And after every three years, it runs to establish a strata for uh, planning. Um, future work for this is actually uh, from uh, DHS to, to plan rep. Now we are sharing the the data manually. So we are looking to integrating uh, the, with the plan rep to allow the automation of sending the data. But also we, are we, we will be also integrating with health facility registry, more like to ensure the co continuous update of the data. But now this process is now uh, having some gaps because there are some words that do not have facilities and you cannot create a strata without having the facility data. So we are looking into different situations on how, on how we could do this. One way it, it could be to use the intersecting word around, using the strata around other words in order to establish this strata or more like other approaches like geospatial modeling and et cetera. So these are things that we are hoping to do in the near future for those words that do not have facility. Um, uh, thank you. So mostly I need to acknowledge my colleague from University of Dar es Salaam, Tempty Program, and also from the government, especially NMCP and the uh, Swiss Embassy. So thank you. Asante. Thank you very much. I also like I also I also get very excited with with maps. So I mean I'm very very easily excitable. In all fairness, um, the next um, presentation I'm just leaving it to you as a default <laughs> because I'm terrified. Um, is uh, from Dr. Wasit Javed, um, who is the health advisor uh, for the IHR strengthening project in Pakistan for the UK uh, HSA. Uh, unfortunately. He also didn't make it in person, but he's presenting online. Um, maybe if I can, if I can uh, manage everything. Can you? Okay, he started sharing already. Fantastic. But should I stop sharing this? No, it's already sharing. Okay, okay. Can you can you try to talk? Cause I I haven't heard you yet. Yes. Uh, can you Yay. share my? Yes, we see your screen perfectly. Thank okay, you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone, uh, and good afternoon. It's almost uh, prayer time here in Pakistan. Uh, so, I'm Dr. Sayed Vasir Javed. Currently, I'm working as a health advisor with UK Health Security Agency here in Pakistan, and we're looking after the implementation of uh, IDSR IHR work in Pakistan. In next few minutes, I'm going to produce uh, the introduction of DHIS2 system to strengthen uh, the dengue vector surveillance in the northwest western province in Pakistan, which is known as Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. So we knew uh, 
we knew that vector surveillance is basically an ongoing systematic process Asif, of collecting. Can I ask you, yeah. please, if you can just like put it in like a presentation mode so it's bigger for us also to see? Okay. It's fine now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, as we know, that vector surveillance uh, is an ongoing systematic process of collection, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination of vector related information to guide response activities or evid evidence based interventions. Uh, the rationale to establish a vector surveillance is to establish uh, the presence of vector identify the mosquito breeding sites, both indoor and outdoor sites, monitor the high-risk areas and uh, population and guide prevention and control strategies. The vector surveillance also uh, help us to evaluate the effectiveness of different vector control activities. Dengue fever, if you talk about Pakistan, so dengue fever is now endemic disease uh, in Pakistan. The first case of dengue was reported way back in 70s and then the superadic cases in the 80s and 90s. But uh, it is now endemic disease with multiple outbreaks and epidemic uh, of dengue fever reported each year across multiple geographic locations in Pakistan. As of now, uh, in 2023, the risk of dengue fever is assessed as high due to predisposing risk factors in the country and also the conducive environment for dengue vector to reproduce into adult Aedes uh, mosquito. Also, uh, you must have an idea about the catastrophic uh, historic floods of Pakistan due to the climate change. So it has increased the risk of dengue fever outbreaks and epidemics in the flood affected areas. Uh, unfortunately, as I speak with you guys, so the coastal areas in Pakistan is facing a huge challenge uh, due to a cyclone, uh, Bepar Joy, they name it Bepar Joy. So we are expecting heavy rainfall, cyclone, and potential flooding in the interior uh, southern uh, province of Pakistan. So again, the, the risk of dengue will be huge in those areas. Uh, Pakistan, talking about the Pakistan, is a federating uh, state with four provinces and two regions. Uh, the northwestern province, uh, uh, where we established that system, is, is known as Khabar Pakhtunkhwa province, uh, which is well known uh, for, his, uh, for its tribal areas bordering Afghanistan. Historically, the province is the gateway to Central Asia. Uh, KP province experienced a huge dengue fever epidemic in 2017 and 2018, when 25,000 lab confirmed cases were reported uh, with more than 100 deaths. Uh, so before the dengue epidemic of 2017 and 18, the government of KP initiated the integrated vector management program for effective prevention and control of vector-borne diseases with special focus on malaria, dengue fever, and cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, under IVM program, the vector surveillance methods uh, are broadly based on OVR larvae traps, uh, pupil and larvae survey, and adult mosquito collection. So uh, you guys have an idea that Pakistan is a resource constrained country. So due to the limited resources, not only the financial resources, but the technical, uh, limited technical capacity, the main method used by the IVM program is the pupil or the larvae survey here in Pakistan. The strategies and activities performed by IVM program for vector surveillance method is characterized into three phases, which starts from the mobilization of uh, outreach vector surveillance team. Uh, then in the second phase, the inspection of houses and mosquito breeding sites, and it ends with the lab confirmation of samples, which the teams collected from the community uh, based on the data collected in the field and the lab results, the program calculate, uh, we call it the vector indices, basically. And uh, uh, these indices, basically, the program, which, which program calculates, 
basically characterize the risk of uh, dengue fever as high, medium, or low across different geographic locations. So uh, for a little bit of context on the dengue fever, so dengue fever is a priority infectious notifiable disease in Pakistan. UK Health Security Agency, along with other partners, is working with the Department of Health uh, here in Pakistan since 2017 to strengthen the priority infectious disease surveillance in Pakistan by implementing integrated uh, disease surveillance and response system uh, by focusing on three pillar system strengthening approach. This is basically the snapshot of the dengue fever cases reported by the KP province in last three years through IDSR DHIS2 system, uh, which UKS, UKHSA established in collaboration with National Institute of Health and Provincial Health Department. This was the first time when DHIS2 digitalization and digitalized disease surveillance for the dengue fever was established in any area of the Pakistan. So in my previous slide, I mentioned that IVM program was struggling with technical and logistical resources to achieve multiple program indicators, which also includes the digitalization of surveillance method. Uh, so UKHSA, after establishing uh, the human dengue fever surveillance in the province, worked with the IVM program to digitalize the vector surveillance by intro introducing DHIS2 vector surveillance system. The layout on your screen is the data collection and flow mechanism, which starts at the community level, right at the community level, where outreach vector surveillance team basically visits houses, indoor areas, houses, or outdoor uh, mosquito breeding sites like ponds, uh, tire shops, and uh, the potential high-risk container site outside. So in the second phase, the team records the response against each variable on a survey questionnaire. The survey form is then uploaded on DHIS2 digital platform in real time. The data is visible at the district and the provincial level. So district is the starting administrative unit here in Pakistan and provincial is the headquarter above the district level. So at the same time, the data is being visible at the district and provincial level, and the data analysts at both level basically can analyze uh, the data by using the DHIS2 system analytics. After the analysis, the information is interpreted and shared with the relevant stakeholders for informed decision making, or the information can be used to guide the response activities uh, where there is high risk indices based on the data collected by the team. The whole process of data collection and flow mechanism is, is, is on the weekly basis currently, but it has the provision, uh, we, can in, uh, we can switch the frequency to the daily basis if there is any outbreak or epidemic of dengue fever is reported. So here is the DHIS2 output on which you can see the responses uh, against different variables. Uh, this graph and lab, uh, table basically gives you the snapshot of number of houses and container examined uh, by the vector surveillance teams, along with the number of houses and container which were found uh, with the presence of dengue larva, which they recorded as positive houses or containers. The system automatically calculates the different indices, uh, which I mentioned in my previous slide, and the relevant people can easily identify the risk of dengue fever, where there is a high indices, the container household or the Brito index. Uh, the program knew uh, that high index area through DHIS2 system, and they can basically uh, uh, guide the response in that specific area of the population. Uh, you can see that output currently uh, for the whole province, but the system has uh, the ability to calculate uh, these indices and uh, the data can be uh, uh, shown in, in, in different districts or, or, or right at the community level at the UC or the TSC level. So the next uh, 
uh, output is the spot mapping. This is basically the whole of the KP province showing different districts. So that data basically using the DHIS to advance analytics uh, can transform into the spot maps and gives the district with high vector indices, uh, which is the direct indication of high risk for the dengue uh, vector. So, so it basically helped the program to direct resources and response to these area are prioritized uh, for the intervention very easily uh, by referring to these spot map maps. This is another output which gives you the indication of houses where dengue larva was found by vector teams across uh, different epidemiological weeks. Uh, also, uh, the system basically tells you uh, the presence of containers. These are, we call them the high risk containers for the dengue. So the data can be analyzed uh, and can be presented in the presence of high risk containers where dengue larva was positive across uh, different week uh, epidemiological weeks. Also, uh, we added into the system uh, to record the capacity building or uh, training of the workshop and gives a snapshot to the program manager and partners that how many trained male or the female staff is available uh, at the community level or at the district level and how many were trained uh, in different weeks. Uh, we know that community, the engagement of community is very important for the prevention control of dengue fever. So uh, the DHIS2 also captures uh, the engagement of local communities uh, for effective prevention and control of dengue fever. The system offers to record community sessions conducted by the program social mobilizers right in the community level. So in the end, uh, how the DHIS2 system or the vector surveillance system basically helped Pakistan and the province uh, because it was the first initial phase uh, of the vector surveillance onto DHIS2 system. So after the digitalization of vector surveillance method, the program captured real time and timely information on the presence of dengue vector, which helped them to prioritize the areas and population of high risk. The DHIS2 uh, vector surveillance dashboard is also accessible to other sectors, which ultimately improve the multi-sector coordination and collaboration which is vital for the dengue fever prevention and control. Uh, since uh, the DHIS2 vector surveillance system was established, uh, as, I would, as I have told you very recently in 2022, uh, the quality data generated by the system helped the IVM program to revise the dengue prevention and control action plan for this year, uh, 2023 and added a few more variables to the system, which will make it more helpful to early detect the dengue vector and ultimately prevent the spread of dengue fever in this summer. Basically, just a couple of days before we receive an official request from IVM program in the province uh, uh, to basically add a few more indicators to the system uh, and uh, build the capacity of their staff onto, onto the system. Uh, with this, I want to acknowledge uh, the support of these people for making this system uh, possible in a very complex political and administrative environment here in Pakistan. At the end, uh, I'm thankful to the DHIS2 conference organizers, scientific committee for giving me the chance to present my work. It's just the start of the D, uh, DHIS2 in Pakistan, and uh, I'm looking forward to work with University of Oslo for the rollout, rollout of DHIS2 in context of One Health and IHR climate change. A lot, a lot to work in the coming years. Uh, taking the opportunity, I, I wanted to, to say a special thanks to Victoria for all her support with regards to my visa problems, although I didn't get at this time, but sooner or later, I will manage to meet all you people in Oslo. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Wasif. 
I hope this is actually like an inspirational um, presentation as normally vector control and entomology tends to be a little bit forgotten, especially in uh, in national systems. And uh, and you can see like how important it can become when you're trying for vector control and in general vector related um, diseases. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wasif. Um, I am very proud of my presenters because they've been unbelievably on time. Um, so I was wondering, like, if you had any questions that you would like to ask them about uh, about their work. All pretty clear. Oh, yay. OK, we have one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited about the stratification work. Um, my question was around, I know in Tanzania, it's not the Ministry of Health who's managing the implementation. It's PO Raj, right? Um, so my question is really around access to DHIS2 and whether the, the Ministry of Health is the one who, who, who are sort of the primary users or does Tamisemi also have access to DHIS2 and how do you build the capacity of sort of non-health workers in some ways uh, to, use, to use these maps, these stratification maps? My other question is around sort of indicators for stratification coverage. I, I know there's you know, a, a mixed package of interventions depending on the strata. Are you going to maybe have a indicators with you know color coded maps which show then how you're implementing the the stratification stratification interventions? Asante. Thank you. I hope I could be able to answer those <laughs> as I am a system developer, but I will try. So in Tanzania, actually, uh, PL RALC, uh, in most cases at uh, sub national level, are the main implementers, but they are working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health. Just quickly to say is all uh, primary level health facility belong to PL RALC. only district, region, and national hospital are the ones that are being managed by the Ministry of Health. But Ministry of Health is actually creating some policies and they live up to PL RALC to more implement everything. So they are really collaborating. And for this work stratification, the outputs that comes in from DHS2 are being used in the, in the plan rep system, which is being owned by PRALG. So there's that uh, collaboration and the, uh, the users are using this data. So as for non-health, that could be tricky for me, but as I know, in CHMTs or in the RHMTs section, there are um, uh, health officers around who uses these data to more likely prepare some different plans. For example, there are very specific malaria planning it's meetings that are being conducted within Pure that uses this data. So I may not be really certain, but hope that answer your yeah, first question. As for the second question, Yes, I only showed a, a stratification map, the final result, but in the same system there, we, we, we put it another visualization like a table that shows the data for those indicators that I highlighted and show how this data brings in this strata. So I just only show what was <laughs> cool to present, but there are more that can be viewed within the dashboard. Hope that answers your questions. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you have any questions, if there's someone else with questions. No, but then I declare this session closed. And uh, and yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone online. And uh, hope uh, this, uh, this session uh, clarified some of your doubts and uh, inspired you to use further DHIS. So thank you very much.
And uh, yeah, if you have any other question to like our presenters, please feel free to let me know and I can put you in touch. Cheers.